Hello everybody, how are you doing? Another two weeks? Yes! What was our president thinking? The good news, he was thinking. Our inconvenience and hardship and difficulty over people's lives, he chose people's lives. Good call, Mr. President. But hey, we're Christians. We'll get through this. We walk by faith and not by sight. I hope that you are not only surviving, but that you are thriving, and that you're using this God-given opportunity to refresh your soul, to be able to speak to your Creator, spend time in His Word, and, and uh, refresh your relationships with your family. What a special time this is, especially if you're watching this on Easter Sunday. You know what day that is? That's the day that Jesus walked out of the tomb. That's the resurrection day. That's the day that gave hope to every one of us. Uh, the resurrection, can I remind you, changed everything. And that's why we do walk by faith and not by sight. So, hey, embrace this time of hardship. Let me remind you, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Embrace it and we'll come through the other side stronger and invigorated. This morning I want to bring you a story which I hope will give you tremendous encouragement. It comes from the life of John the Baptist. Of course, John was the son of Zacharias. His father was a priest and his mother's name was Elizabeth. They were extremely old when they had John. In fact, John was a miracle baby. The parents had prayed to God and prayed to God and they were barren. Eventually, God gave them John. He was an only child. And of course, we we, we know he grew up to be this wild man uh, living in the wilderness and preaching uh, uh, repentance, telling people the kingdom of heaven is coming. And one day he is, uh, he is baptizing people in the Jordan River and along comes cousin Jesus. And Jesus says to John, you need to baptize me. And of course, John is horrified at that. And after some discussion, eventually John gets to baptize Jesus and he gets to be a witness to the voice from Almighty God saying this referring to Jesus this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased what an honor what a privilege for John to be able to declare to the world the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world so let's take the story to 16 months later John is in prison and why is why is he in prison because he told Herod that he was committing adultery. He told Herod, you cannot take your brother's wife and marry her. Herod was furious. There's only one person who was more furious than Herod, and that was his wife. And so Herod chucked him in prison. Now, while he was in prison, Herod's wife organized a party for her husband, Herod. She got him extremely drunk, and then she did something that only a really immoral, ungodly woman would do. She brought her very own daughter and got her daughter to dance before Herod. No doubt her daughter was scantily clad. No, no doubt her daughter uh, was provocative in uh, her dance. And it had its desired effect. In his drunken stupor, he said to his wife, You have pleased me so much, I'm going to give you anything you want, up to half of my kingdom. His wife, boy, she had her request so ready. She said, This is what I want. I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. I'm sure John got to hear that this evil woman wanted his head on a a platter. He knew the time was ticking and it was only a short time before he would die by the guillotine. Two disciples come to him and he sends them. He says, listen, I want you to go and find Jesus. I want, I, I want to find out. Does he know I'm here? Does he know I'm in chains? Does he know I'm about to die? And then he, he says to them, I want you to find out, is he the one? Which, which is very strange because John had already declared that Jesus was the one. He was the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. While his disciples went out, they found Jesus in a little village. And what was he doing? Jesus was doing these incredible 
miracles. The, the blind were able to see again. The deaf were able to hear. The lame were able to walk again. And, and these disciples got to watch this. And uh, it, it seems like uh, to me that Jesus kind of knew they were there, but ignored them. And they just got to watch this incredible miracle show. And then at the end of the day, Jesus comes and he says to them, and you can read this in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 4. Go, says Jesus, and tell John the things which you have seen and you have heard. And then in verse 6, he says, Blessed is he who does not stumble on account of me. Now an amazing thing happens. As John's disciples leave and go back to report on, uh, on Jesus, Jesus turns to the crowd and he says a number of things. But one of the most remarkable things you will read in the scripture is found in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11. And this is what Jesus says about John. Truly I tell you, among those born of woman there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. What? Jesus? Have you heard of Abraham and Moses and Isaac and Jacob and Joshua and Isaiah and Jeremiah and all those greats from the Old Testament? Jesus says, no one greater born of woman than John the Baptist. What a remarkable statement. And, and what I find uh, amazing is it seems John never got to hear these words. Imagine how it would have boosted his morale as he was there in prison, chained, waiting for the day of his execution. But it seems John never get, got to hear that the Son of God got to call him the greatest man that was ever born of woman. Isn't that remarkable? So I want to share with you a message that I don't think John got to hear. But I think if John had to hear the words of Jesus, he would have been able to take these three messages from the words of Jesus. Number one, you are doing better than you think you are. Even in prison, John, you're doing better than you think you are. Even in lockdown, you are doing better than you think you are, you know? The Bible describes Satan as the accuser. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10 says, Satan is the accuser of Christians. He's the accuser, the, the scriptures say, of the brethren, of you and I. And he wants us to believe we're not doing very well. We're not good enough. We should just give up and quit. Nothing would give Satan greater pleasure to hear that you do not believe in yourself and in your God. I want you to know on the other side of the coin, there is someone who believes in you. It is Jesus. And he, he needs, you to, needs you to understand that you are doing better than you think you are. Yes, you're not perfect, but you're not the person that you used to be. You, you believe in Jesus. That's why you are watching these sermons. You believe in a heavenly father. You are doing better than you think you are. And you're going to get there by God's grace. So don't give up. Don't quit the faith. Stop putting yourself down. That's the job of Satan. Start believing in yourself. After all, you have the gift of God's spirit living inside your life. Your life. You are doing better than you think you are. Do not allow Satan to rob you of the joy of living in the light, even in lockdown. Now in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we read about different seasons or different times in life. In fact, the writer gives us 28 different seasons in life. For instance, listen to this. There is a time to be born and there is a time to die. Two seasons. There is a time to laugh and a time to cry. There is a time to dance and a time to mourn. There is a time to gather and there is a time to let go. And he carries on with these different times in life. One time or one season you'll never read about is the time to quit. Hey John, while you're in prison, do not quit. Do not give up the faith. Hey church, 
while you're in lockdown, do not quit. You are doing better than you think you are. I know it's tough financially. I know, I know probably your relationships are strained right now in that, that little house or room, wherever you are. This is not a time to quit. Now, I know some of you might know somebody who's really struggling to keep their head above water. It's time. Pick up the phone. Get your eyes off yourself. Give them a call. Send them a text. Encourage them. Hang in there. You have a father who loves you with all of his heart. I know, I know it's hard in lockdown, but do not quit. So some of you are, are sitting there thinking, Brian, you don't even know my circumstances. How can you say with such assurance that I am doing better than I think I am? This I know. You're watching this video, aren't you? You could be watching Netflix. You could be watching YouTube or something else. You're watching this video. And I'll tell you why you're watching this video. You believe in God. And you believe in His Son, Jesus Christ, don't you? And I know the Bible says Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. And if He goes and prepares a place for us, He says He's going to come and take us home to glory. Don't let the accuser rob you of that joy you are doing better than you think you are point number two i think john would have got this if he had heard the words of jesus point number two is this you matter more than you think you do there is a remarkable passage of scripture in isaiah chapter 41 and verse 6 which says everyone helped his neighbor and said to his brother be of good courage, be of good courage, be of good courage. And then when you drop down to the very next, next verse, it reads like this. The craftsman encourages the goldsmith, and he who smooths with a hammer, him who strikes the anvil, saying of the soldiering, it is good. And they fastened it with nails so that it cannot be moved. Don't miss this. The metal worker encouraged the goldsmith. And the one who did the soldering was encouraging the one who, uh, who worked out, the, the, who hammered the metal. And the one who hammered out the metal, he, he encouraged the person who worked on the anvil. And someone encouraged the welder. All these craftsmen were encouraging one another. You see, what they were saying to each other is, you matter. No, you matter. No, you matter. You, you matter more than you think you did. And they, the reason they were doing it is so that no one would totter. No one would feel, I don't matter. They didn't want anyone to get wobbly. They didn't want anyone to grow weary and give up. And I want you to know today, God wants you to know that you matter. Do not give up. And if you know somebody who once again is struggling with to keep their head above uh, above the water you need to contact him and say you matter to God you matter my brother you matter my sister Jesus died for you that's why you matter and, and you help out in any way you can I want to say to you who are our parents today man you do an, you don't you're doing an incredible job you know when it's it, it must be extremely difficult to have little children running around the house in lockdown 24 7 i don't know if it's going to be 365 let's hope not but you matter and i i, I want you to understand this is possibly a gift from god that you would never have had otherwise 24 7 time with your children to sow into their lives to teach them to model for them so consider this time a special present that God has given you. You matter to those children. You matter to God. You matter to Jesus. So in your time of frustration and saying, I wish I could get out of here, understand, you matter to your children. And uh, what a special time this is. This time of bonding that you can spend with them. John the Baptist, you matter more than you thought you did. Can I read 
John, uh, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11, again, these words which John never heard. Truly I tell you, Jesus said, among those born of woman, there has not risen another greater than John the Baptist. Never got to hear those words. John, John, listen, John, can you hear me? You matter. You've done a fantastic job. You've introduced the Lamb of God to the world. You matter more than you think you do. Even in prison. John, listen. You matter more than you think you did. Uh, more than you think you do. Hey church, even in lockdown, don't give up. You matter to God more than you think you do. Lesson number three is this. It's less about you than you think. Hey, John, it's less about you than you think. John never heard these words. Hey, church, it's less about you than you think. You know, sometimes things, some things happen in our lives, but it has to do with a bigger picture than just about us. John is in prison and he thinks, this is all about me. And Jesus is outside thinking, this is all about the kingdom. Remember when you were born again? Remember when you came out dripping wet from the waters of baptism, the euphoria you felt? And you were told and shown in the scriptures, the angels in heaven were exploding with joy. Well, let me tell you, it's less about you than you think. See, what's going on here is a cosmic battle. There is a bigger picture to consider right here. And the reason the angels are in heaven are rejoicing is because as you and I as sinners come to Jesus. But, you know, it's because God's kingdom is, is overcoming Satan. It's less about us than we think. You ever wondered why when Adam and Eve had messed up such, in, in such a big way, why God didn't wipe them out? and start again. Well, this is the reason. God's not into replacing broken product. God wants to fix what is broken. And if you feel worthy and if you feel broken, you need to know today. God wants to fix you. And the reason he wants to fix you is because he loves you. And also, there's a bigger picture than you might have wondered about. You ever wondered why God didn't say in a broken marriage, hey, just get a divorce, go and get, go and get another him, go and get another her. God said, I hate divorce. God wants to fix that marriage because there is a bigger picture going on. There is a story of a man whose car broke down and he lifted up the bonnet and he tinkered around for a while. He just couldn't get that car to stop. And eventually this huge limousine drove up and a man got out the back he was dressed in this meticulous suit. He looked like a million bucks. And he said to the man who owned the broken car, can I help you? The guy was kind of skeptical. And he said, okay. The man in the suit took off his jacket, rolled up his sleeve, and he worked underneath that bonnet. And eventually he said to the car owner, turn the key. And he turned the key and the engine roared into life. The car owner was so thankful and he said, what? Do I owe you? And, uh, and, and the man in the suit said, you owe me nothing. The guy said, well, why did you stop? And the man in the suit says, my name is Henry Ford. And I hate to see a car that I created not doing what it was created to do. If you're feeling worn out and down and ready to quit, you need to know today. God wants to fix you. And the reason he wants to fix you because is he, he wants to see his creation doing what it was created to do, to give God glory and to give God honor and to live out every day expecting the Savior to return and take us home to glory. It's less about you than you think, you see, because there is a cosmic battle going on. And you are part of that cosmic battle and, and I'm part of that cosmic battle. And when we hang in there and when we live out our lives doing what we were created to do, God gets the glory. 
and Jesus gets the honor and the kingdom is advanced. When he lost his wealth, when he lost his children, when he lost his crops and his herds and his vineyards, Job did not understand what was going on when he lost his health. You see, what was going on was there was a cosmic conversation between God and Satan. God was bragging about Job to Satan. He said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Perhaps if you're going through a hard time right now and you're hanging in there and you're still praising God, God is saying to Satan, have you considered my servant? Put your name in there. So Satan says to God, the only reason Job is serving you is because you have put a hedge around him. In other words, you look after him, you provide for him, you give him every single thing he's got. So that's why God allowed Satan to strip Job of everything. And guess what he discovered? He discovered Job honored God and praised God in the midst of the most horrific circumstances. Say, Satan needs to remind himself that he couldn't even serve God when he was in, was in heaven in a sinless and devilless society. You and I, we serve, we praise, we acknowledge our Father and His Son Jesus and the Spirit in spite of a sinful world and in spite of the fact that we have got the accuser breathing down our neck all the time. Job did not serve God because of, he served God in spite of. You know, it's one thing to worship God when everything is going great. When the money in the bank and you live in a nice home and the car doesn't break down and your job is going great and, and everything is smooth. But it is quite another thing to worship God when you're at the bottom of the barrel. When life has fallen out underneath you, like Job. But when you do that, you realize it's less about you than many people think. So let me encourage you with these words as we close. Three points. Number one, you are doing better than you think you are. Number two, you matter more than you think you do. And number three, it's less about you than you think. I hope tomorrow morning you ought to jump out of bed and you will say, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Let me leave you with this encouragement from Jude 24 and verse 25. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.